welcome. We're excited to have you guys. I want to introduce you to our dear friend Brandon, who we have just fallen in love with over the past year and a half now. Yeah. I think it was, it where's been. Connie? Yeah. yeah. Last June, when we embarked on a world of pizza, we quickly just fell in love with Brandon and the food that he creates. Um, he is a master with dough, all things in the kitchen, truthfully. Um, but he really has a love and a passion for bread, which I don't know if you guys are like me, but for many years I was really intimidated by bread. Um, I am a, one of those people who cannot get roads rolls to ever work, but I can make homemade bread. So don't, I mean, I just can't balance those two things. And so my whole life trying to do frozen dough, thinking like, well, this isn't going to work. And then come to find out it's actually easier than doing roads rolls when you make your own bread. And so... Um, Brandon has helped us to embark on a world of bread and pizza dough and has just completely changed my Friday night pizza nights uh, because of his Neapolitan style pizza dough um, and just his love and his passion for food. He does the same thing Friday nights with his girls at, at, in his house and he does it much fancier than I am. I'm always like, don't let my kids see this. <laughs> because Brandon is always doing such amazing things. Um, but he also has been a part of many restaurants that you may be familiar with. Oak Wood Fire Kitchen down in Draper. Um, if you haven't tried that, please go soon and go try the goat cheese. That is like, I every time I'm like, Brandon, I fell in love with you before I knew you because of that appetizer. Um, but then also even Stevens and I'm tell me Blue Lemon, Blue Lemon. Trio. I've been around. <laughs> but he helps just other restaurants kind of redesign their menu and make sure that they're offering really, really great food. Currently he's working with Cisco, which um, if you're not familiar with like the restaurant style of things that is where a lot of restaurants look at their food. And so he helps to make sure they're getting really the best proteins and doing all of that. So um, which is with his girls at home, he wanted to be home a little bit more, so you have to sometimes trade that restaurant life and, and switch gears for that, which I know his family really appreciates. So he's he's a we've got a beautiful family. So, um, but today we we tasked him to give us something a little savory because chocolate belongs in all as aspects of our lives. And until like two days ago, we had no idea what he was doing. And I don't know if you guys are like me, but sometimes you look at that recipe that's on, on your handout and you're like, where's the rest of it? Like, what else do I need to do? And this is a true sign of a really great chef, is that he's going to give you some guidelines, but he's going to also make it so that you guys have the right groundwork, but then you can really embrace it and make it your own. Um, and so if you need a pen or a pencil, let us know. I've got some pencils up here, but I think we're going to make a few tweaks too, right? Yeah. True, true Brandon fashion. Is, you've got to pay attention to really <laughs> know what we're going to be teaching you guys today. Um, but we're excited you guys trusted us. We're excited to have you here. And am I missing anything? I don't think so. No. He is a wealth of knowledge. We were joking back there that if I could just take a sliver of all the things that he can share... Um, I would be happy to go, but I just have a bunch of random facts. No, but it's so fun to, to learn from him. So we're, we're glad you're here, and it's all you, my friend. Thank you, thank you. All right, well, this is kind of exciting because we've done pasta class here before, which are always fun. I think with the chocolate extravaganza, we had to kind of adjust some things. I think that everybody was kind of like deserted out, you know, and needed something different in their life. And chocolate has applications in history way before in savory applications when you look into really ancient Mayan you know Aztec Mexican recipes there's a ton of savoriness that's used in chocolate and chocolate's very bitter so because of that I think it lends some really nice notes to savory applications I don't it, do you guys have you ever tasted chocolate savory do you enjoy it do you like it do you like cooking with it I think the one secret that I kind of played with this year was adding chocolate to my chilies Chili, it tends and adds a really great thing with all those different spices and a little bit of cumin and garlic goes really far with just a tiny bit of chocolate. It kind of adds that little kick to make it so you can win the word chili party. So. Yeah. <laughs> so first I want to talk about pasta. So pasta, I think the biggest issue that everybody has with pasta is that it's so hard to make in their mind, right? How many of you made pasta at home? All right, that's decent. How many were successful? Okay, all right, less hands, but still. Okay, so what do you think is the, was the most challenging part, one of you that made it and didn't have success? Anybody brave enough to say? Just getting the pasta the right consistency. 
Exactly. It's, it's true. So one really big secret that restaurants don't want you to know is that if the pasta sticks to your hands, it'll stick to the machine, okay? So you have to make pasta dough that is dense enough that it won't stick, okay? And as much as that recipe is tried and true, we messed it up even today. So today when we made it, it was too sticky. And so a lot of different factors happen when it comes to this, is that the flour absorbs too much of the, of the liquid in the eggs, or the, the flour was harvested at a certain time of year. I mean, there's so many different factors, and that's why you see so many people do what's called the well method, to incorporate slowly all the liquid into the rest of the flour, and you can go slow on how much you add. And if it seems like it's too dry or too wet, you can then adjust it, and so there's time. So the main thing is, is once you're done, you want it to not look like it has any flour, and you want it to not stick to your hands when you're grabbing it, and that helps out a ton. So, since we'll just jump right into it, because the pasta needs to rest, this is one thing that I always make first. A lot of times, if I'm gonna make it on a Sunday, I'll make this on Friday. It's okay to sit. Um, if you're too scared to leave it at room temperature, which I'm not, I leave it at room temperature for three or four days, but if you're too scared, you put it in the refrigerator, just make sure you pull it out maybe four hours before you're gonna use it so it's nice and room temperature. Um, but this part can be done way ahead of time. Don't make it the day of. You'll hate making pasta if you have to make it the same day you're gonna cook it. Just break it up a little bit and that already helps a ton. I think when you're making pasta day of, it just seems like it's, well, it's two or three hours waiting, it's two or three hours mixing, then I'm gonna make the sauce and then I'm gonna build everything. But if you have parts of it already done, you know, you are making soup on Friday and you just happen to make the pasta for Sunday while you have everything out and dirty, right? So there's a few things that'll, that'll kind of change up. Because it is the chocolate extravaganza, we are going to add our cocoa powder. Now there is a very, you know, extensive amount of cocoa powder in this recipe and it does adjust things. So don't try and use this recipe without the cocoa powder because a lot of things had to get adjusted. So I'm just gonna mix all the dry ingredients first. I think it's just smart to just disperse them. And so this is using two types of flour, which is kind of against a lot of things because in Northern Italian pasta where you um, use eggs, you traditionally don't use semolina. They like it to absorb really fast, so they use double zero. But because of the cocoa powder, it kind of changed um, the gluten strands a little bit, so we had to add a little bit of a harder wheat flour in there to really make sense, okay? So just mixing that up. We've made a well, okay? This well, this is called the well method. And we're gonna add our eggs, okay? I'm gonna go slow. So I'm gonna not add all of them, and we're gonna look at it, because we had it a little too sticky when we made this backstage. But what you're looking for is kind of break up everything, okay? And the egg yolks have a ton of fat in them, and you need that fat, but sometimes it's still not enough in order for it to kind of carry all the flavors and to go through the machine without needing a ton of flour. So we do add a little olive oil. And olive oil and chocolate just love each other, so. We're gonna try and mix those ingredients together. Can you tell us what double zero flour is? Yes, good question. <laughs> uh, sometimes just assume everybody knows these things, right? So double zero flour is a classification of flour of how fine it's been milled. So they basically mill the flour and they run it through these like sock sieves to a certain fineness. And in Italy, um, they have different classifications of how fine it is. So double zero is the finest <laughs> grade of flour. Oh look it, even Siri wants to tell me all about it. Um, even the finest, uh, the flour, the finest flour is double zero, and they have zero. They have type one, type two. And they have Manitoba, and they have semolina. And so Manitoba would be considered like bread flour, and semolina is like really bigger <coughs> grains, right? So double zero is just the finest grain. So it's the easiest to absorb liquids, and it has the most extensibility, which means it can stretch the furthest without breaking and it stays there. So with pizza, like you're wanting to stretch it out without it breaking and to stretch it out nicely, and same with pasta. You need that extra stretch. And so it's kind of a mid-range of protein. So our flour is usually based off of protein. So American flour, they'll say bread flour, which is high, just 12 to 14% protein, right? And you have cake flour that's below usually nine or 8% protein. So the, la the lack of that flour makes it so it has less gluten, so it'll make fluffier cakes, right? And then anything that doesn't classify either one of them ends up in all purpose. And what ends up happening is that random stuff ends up in all purpose, so you can never trust all purpose. Unless it's maybe from like a, 
uh, King Arthur, those ones have exact amounts of protein in each one. And so those are different, where you can kind of trust them a little bit more. But if you just go into any grocery store and you put all-purpose, you have no idea how much protein. And so I would never suggest that for pizza, pizza or pasta. Like, you can search out the double zero. Um, we, they sell double zero flour here, which is a local organic double zero flour made in, in uh, milled in Tremont. So that's one that I would suggest. Just come in here and grab the right stuff. Good Thank question. You. So we're just gonna incorporate little by little, okay? And we just wanna make sure that we're trying to reach that exact um, consistency of not too wet. And so it's easy to do with your hands. She had a bench scraper for me at one time here. Oh, right there. So once you get to a point where you don't really feel, where you're starting to feel a dough start, could you move the other the pasta so we could see the, the, the chicken in, in the right. Oh. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> oh yeah, so here's the double zero flour that is here at Orson Gigi. So there's great opportunities. And also there's another um, any kind of Italian import store like Granados. Um, Caputo's, those guys have double zero flour as well. And Amazon, hate to support the big guy, but there's always double zero flour on Amazon, right? What about pizza flour? Yep, so double, you'd use double zero the same. Yep. So, that's what uh -huh. so pizza and pasta usually goes double zero. Now, there is specialty double zero flour for pizza that has a little bit higher protein, but your standard Caputo blue double zero flour that you'd use for pasta works great for pizza as well. So I'm gonna do just a little technique here. Once I kind of feel that it's looking nice. I'm gonna do this little technique of just incorporating, doing a little chop, the same way that you might do, you know, uh, pie dough. Okay. And what this does is, I'm not trying to develop a ton of gluten yet, and so I'm just trying to hydrate all the flour. And so, if you were gonna make like a gnocchi, I wouldn't. Even, I would never even need it. I would just use this to incorporate it. That way you're, you're not creating that gluten that makes it gummy and unneaky. But we're going to capitalize on all this gluten here. So I can feel in my hands that we're, we probably have enough liquid. And it has to do with that, with that um, cocoa powder just doing. So it um, just absorbs the, the liquid a little bit more. Does it matter what cocoa powder? Like a Dutch process? Not really. Or, okay. No, it doesn't really matter. It's kind of what you have around or what you, you know, feel like at the time. I think you can get as fancy as you want. I think that you should. It's a, it, anytime where you like invest in an ingredient, I feel like you treat it a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like it's just a good process to just get nice things and you treat them nicer and you go the extra mile to, to make sure that you've done them right. You know, I think when you buy a really nice steak, then you're careful not to overcook it. But if you buy a really cheap piece of meat, you don't really care. It's like, ah, oh, it's overcooked, it's fine, right? Mm -hmm. I think the same thing goes for equipment as well. If you have a nice chef knife, you treat it nicer and it stays sharp for longer. Like that kind of attitude just works with most items in the kitchen, I think. But if you're using a nice cocoa powder, you're gonna taste that cocoa powder. So if you're using just regular Hershey's, you're gonna taste that regular Hershey's in the end product. So kind of up to you of what you're what you like the most okay okay so what's really nice about this well method is that you can kind of see that it makes a mess which is really exciting but also you can choose how much flour you're going to incorporate and it's not a big deal that amount of flour if we throw any away is going to be cents on the dollar so don't worry about it i think that's the big thing is people worry about waste and once you work in a kitchen you realize how much waste you 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 produce and it's just part of life I wouldn't encourage you to throw away everything all the time but right here if we end up with a couple scraps that don't get incorporated it's not the end of the world we want the pasta to be perfect rather than worry about the every single morsel of flour right yeah, so that's a good product to throw the whole thing away exactly yeah you want to met that's why it's a gram recipe so that it can be as exact as possible but like I say we mixed it earlier and it became super sticky when we had all the ingredients so I left about an egg and a half out of the recipe that we have posted there. So just know that if you start little and work up to it, 
it's probably a better situation. Can you freeze the dough? You can. This freezes amazingly. So if you want to make a double, triple, quadruple batch and then freeze it off. And honestly, especially when you're doing for holidays, like for sure make it now for Thanksgiving if you're going to do something like this. Like don't make it day up. How long can you keep the dough in the fridge? In the fridge, it starts to oxidize and sort of taste weird at about eight days. So, and you'll see if it doesn't have, with the cocoa powder, you won't be able to see the oxidation because it'll turn brown, right? If it's regular pasta, but you'll see flecks of oxidized flour mm -hmm. that'll happen in it. And those flecks, like, they don't taste that great. And you'll start to see that the gluten will break down as well after about a week. But you can get way far ahead of it. So you can kind of see, like, this is the amount that I'm just not going to incorporate. So it's not a ton. But I like the way that it's feeling now, so I don't want to add any more. And now it's a little bit of brute force in order to get it to the right consistency. It does take time. Like when you see a recipe and it's like, knead for 10 minutes, I'm sorry. It usually means you have to knead for 10 minutes. And it's a little bit of a workout. But there's a method where you can kind of smear it, where you kind of like break it up a little bit. And that helps expose each one of the grains. A lot of Italians will hate you for it because it seems like it's too aggressive for the pasta. Um, but it helps you open it up to where you can get like every single thing. And then also, because this flour absorbs water so well, even if you don't need it enough, if you have it to where you don't see dry flour, you wrap this it'll continue to develop gluten while it's just sitting there on the counter. So this was made what? Like an hour ago? Hour. About an hour ago. And it was pretty close to the same consistency and you can already see how soft it is. And so it'll be fun to make. So the magic of TV, we've got this one ready. Okay? <laughs> we've let this one rest. So now we're gonna start our filling, okay? Once again, I made this filling. I know it doesn't look that sexy. Uh, it was made last night, okay? That's what you should do too. Don't make it the day of. Make it the next four. I think it's way too hard. Like, everybody at home makes their life too hard by trying to make so many things. Like, a really nice meal. If you've ever been to a restaurant, that was made three days ago. Everything was. And they assembled it the day of. And it's beautiful and perfect. Just know that that's the secret. There's a thing called mise en place in restaurants. It's where we get everything ready before service. We cut up all the, all the vegetables, we braised all the stuff off, we made the pasta dough, we did all that hours before you ever walk in the door, and then we just assemble it. And people think it's the greatest thing ever. You should do the exact same thing, just assemble it. And then you have time to hang out with your friends, you have time to, to be a good host. You know? I think that's just uh, the one part that everybody's gonna see. Okay. Actually, I need one another cord, cutting board. You grab me just another cutting board like this, mm -hmm. just to cut up some stuff. You can't see this. Can you? No. Well, that one does. We can see it. Yeah. Kinda. <laughs> I'll push this a little bit this way. I'll cut some stuff up over here, maybe. I don't know. What do you guys think? You gotta come in closer too. I mean, I don't. I don't bite. Much. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Would this be better or this be better? Can you guys see okay if I do over here? Do it on this side. Over here? It's better? Yeah. Everybody can see right here? Kinda? <laughs> Is there a way to put it under the camera? Sorry. They got some weird placement of cameras this year, and so they're more important. They want to see me make the pasta, and that's why this one's here. And this one, you're going to see me after I make everything. This is just while I'm cutting up stuff. I don't know if you guys, you know, cutting up stuff isn't quite as poor. But, she grabbed me salt. Okay, so you can see this pot right here, right? Yeah. So we're going to go olive oil in here. It's a good amount of olive oil. We want the fat. You're going to get a decent amount of fat from... So I did chuck roast. It, you can do whatever you want. Um, whatever beef that you prefer. This recipe is actually based off of um, a veal filling that I used to make at a restaurant called uh, Parma. 
in California. And so you would braise off a piece of veal like this. And once it's braised, you would chop it up and you would add all these amazing like cookie spices, like nutmeg and allspice. And so I just thought that those flavors blended really well to chocolate. And that's how I came up with this recipe. If you want any manageable pieces, okay? So you don't have to go super small, but if you've ever made any kind of like braise, like a uh, chuck roll, any of that kind of stuff, you want some manual pieces that you can like sear off really nicely. And because we're gonna do so much in the filling afterwards, you don't have to worry about this product as much. You want to make sure that it's cooked enough, has the right base flavor, and it's nice and braised. Thank you. Other thing that we do at restaurants you don't is salt. You need more salt. You need more salt. I go. We. I buy one of these like one pound containers from here, and it's like a week. I use so much salt at home. So. That's why my food maybe tastes different than the stuff that you've got. We're going to brown this kind of evenly. We want to get some color. There's a thing called the Maillard reaction that's created when you sear beef. It just makes everything taste better. So if you've ever like done a, a braise like this or done in a slow cooker like a hot pot, the big difference is that sear that you're not getting. And it's a huge difference in flavor. It's just way tastier. It is. You can fake it with like different chemicals and like what's that, uh, like mix and gas and those things. Kind of create the same idea of umami, but really the way to create it naturally is just to sear the product and fully. Okay. So we're looking for a nice sear. So you want a hot pan. You're gonna make a mess. Sorry, Heather. Um, but once you kind of have a good sear, we're gonna put a few different ingredients in here. So one is wine. I don't want you to be scared of wine. I know that you caught one of those things where it's really hard in your mind. You need to go to the liquor store, buy the wine that's needed, find a wine that makes sense, right? It's, it's a hard thing. I think for me, it was the same way for a long time as a chef. You go, to, you go there, you're worried you're gonna see like a bishop or a state president or someone in the parking lot can do it, but it's fine. It's for cooking and it's amazing and you cannot make sure you say this anything else, there's no way. I worked for the Joe Smith Memorial Building um, in their culinary department for a few years, and they had alcohol-free red and white wine. Absolutely horrible. It was the worst thing. You would be cooking, you would taste it, and I'm like, this is real wine. We're gonna cook it all out, right? So this is gonna break four hours. So it all takes a time if you sear something and then you just see glaze with red wine, you're gonna take out 83% of the alcohol instantly. Okay. On a braise, you'll take out another five to six percent. There's going to be maybe four residual four percent alcohol over the entire thing, right? A loaf of bread has fourteen percent. So you're, you're already consuming alcohol regularly. Right Don't get scared, okay? Part of like any fermented product has alcohol. Your kombucha has three to four percent alcohol in it. So like, there's alcohol, okay? So we gave this whew, a little sear. Okay, so the secret ingredient here is the allspice. Allspice is amazing. It's gonna, after the long braise, you're gonna get some really cool flavors that come through that. They're gonna pair amazingly with the chocolate. We're gonna put that in now because we wanna kinda fry it up a little bit. The garlic, you can do one or two things. You can remove it after if you want, because we're not gonna chop this, but we really want it to smash it. It's gonna get the most flavor out of it. And then we're going to, because uh, in the long braise, Italians would seriously pull this out after long race. I don't know why, they just don't like tons of, of, uh, of garlic and things like this. And then if you were accidentally to get it in your dish, you're supposed to do the dishes after. So, you could have a fun little game with your family, put crushed garlic cloves in each one of their dishes just so they have to do it. So, so if you do buy wine and go to the liquor store, right, and go through the whole process here in Utah, I would suggest trying to find a natural wine. They're horrible to help you with this, but this is this contains no sulfites or additives, it's just grapes that are fermented, and so that's what I would suggest. 
there are a few importers that kind of lean towards that way. But this one actually says at the top that it doesn't contain sulfites. And sulfites are like the end of the world. Sulfites have been used to preserve uh, food since the times of the Romans. So it's not that it's unnatural, but some people say they get headaches from it and things like that. And so all natural wines are the way to go. So it's about two cups that we're looking for to kind of get, and we're just gonna deglaze. Now I might get a little bit more color on that before I deglaze it, but you know, time crunch and all. This is a sprig of rosemary. We're gonna give that a rough chop as well. Brandon? Yeah. If you were making just a regular pot roast, and let's say you weren't putting the ravioli in it, would you still, could you still use the chocolate and the um, allspice? Oh yeah. And it would still up the flavor? Oh yeah, for sure. Like I think that allspice is one of those things that like no one ever, oh, it lit on fire, that's exciting. Um, <laughs> Um, allspice is one of those things that you don't see in very many dishes in general unless they're sweet and so I just think allspice lends a really nice flavor to a lot of things but beef you have to think that for so many years beef is actually pretty disgusting to be honest with you okay so beef is supposed to hang for upwards of 21 days at below refrigeration temperatures to age properly then it, they usually wash it down with vinegar and then, or worse chemicals, and then they'll butcher it and they'll cut into things. So you have to think that in the you know 1800s, it would be hanging outside for days at a time before somebody bought it, and it would create some some funk. And so what the Italians and a lot of places would do with these kind of spices, they would get for their along the spice route, they would add these to them randomly. Especially in Northern Italy, they were rich. They had a ton of money in Northern Italy. In Northern Italy, you'll see that their recipes have way more butter, less olive oil, tons of cheese. You have to think that everything in the north is what we know of it from Italy pretty much. Like, so Parma is in the north in a state called Emilia Romana. You get Parmesan cheese from there. You get prosciutto de Parma. Uh, you get uh, burro de palm. You get, uh, then just a little bit further south is Modena. That's where you get all the balsamic vinegar, okay? And then, so there's just a, amazing products. Oh, also, uh, I don't know if you're into uh, uh, mortadella. You ever had mortadella? Mortadella comes from a city that's called Bologna, and then we've pronounced it Bologna for some reason, right? But Bologna is a great city as well where Bolognese comes from. So it's really rich, deep, dark braised dishes. A lot of them come from Northern Italy, and they contain those crazy spices. And I think it was just because of how the spice trade went, and the people that had money, and the royal families up north, just used more of it, because they wanted to show how cool they were, okay? So you'll see a lot of recipes that are that way. So, with the magic of television, right? We're gonna cover this, we're gonna throw it into an oven for about four hours, and what you'll see is it'll, it'll get really like syrupy, It'll almost dry out, it'll almost burn. So I would watch it. Once you get it three and a half to four hours, you should have a point where it seems like a dry thing. Now I did like three or four pounds, so I wouldn't have extra. So it's not gonna be this much that's gonna yield, obviously. Um, I've already gave a little bit of a chop on it as well. What you're looking for, and in the recipe it says to chop it, you're looking for when you press it, it kind of falls apart at the very least, okay? And it's way better to do this the day before and let it, and let it hang out because the flavors will be better for one, and for two, it'll kind of fall apart further, and for three, it's way easier to produce the end product, right? Okay. Could you hold it under this camera so we could get a Oh, yes. Um, so what point do you add the chocolate? Oh, that's good, nice. Way to catch me in my stuff there. <laughs> Right now. Okay. <laughs> yes. So the chocolate you don't want to cook while it's sauteing because it will like solidify and crystallize, get weird. But it'll melt really nicely if you put it in at the braised part of it, right? Okay. So then that's when you would. Have it, right? <laughs> so the next day, because you did this the day before, because you're so smart, you're gonna have this product ready. Okay. So now we're gonna have all of the filling. So. Once again, because we're coming from Northern Italy, it's such a rich area and all the things that we're gonna add. We've got ricotta cheese, 
Jakarta cheese is an amazing cheese. You have Parmesan cheese also from the north. The best cows come from the north. And then the, if you want to go south and get good cheese, you have to get it from Buffalo because the Buffalo have higher fat content. And that's why you'll see like mozzarella is a southern cheese, okay? And you'll see somewhere in between in the south as well, especially towards Lazio, you'll see a lot of goat and sheep's milk cheese. So you have like Pecorino Romano is like Rome where they have a sheep's milk style of Parmesan, okay? So this one, I'm going to add all these ingredients to this here. So the ricotta, the Parmesan, okay? The allspice, the nutmeg. I'm gonna, maybe I'll grade nutmeg. I have nutmeg. I'm gonna grade it fresh. So this is one where I think that you should just always grade fresh. Just the smell of pre-ground nutmeg isn't this nice, for one. And for two, it's so cheap and easy to find. Nutmeg that's just in a chunk. And then you just grate it to order. It smells so much better. Brandon, where can you get uh, the seed? The nutmeg? Most grocery stores now have it. You'll see it, it'll look like this. They usually come like three or four to one of those little jars, the green lid. Um, I get all my spices from the Asian import store because they're the best place to get them. And they usually have whole spices and um, they're in big quantities. So I would always buy them for the restaurant. And with these, they have an outer hole and so the outer hole keeps a lot of the essential oils in. And so if you just get it like this and you don't break it until you need it, this will last you years, okay? Now that'll last me a couple months because I broke it open. I have a question on here on the, um, the braised beef. It mm -hmm. says whole allspice and then this is ground allspice. Yeah, so we're just um, capitalizing on the same flavors. So we want whole allspice here because it's gonna break down over four hours. So what is that? And then it's just little, those little berries. Oh, they look berries. like peppercorns. Oh, okay. they look like, they're a little bit bigger than a peppercorn, but they have a little bit more flavor. And then, so we're gonna use that and then we're gonna use ground here. Ground. And, if you, and if you have a spice grinder at home, buy the whole ones and just grind them, right, for this recipe. I, I've broken all of my spice grinders. But you can buy like, so if you go to like a DI or something, you can get an old coffee grinder and wash it out really well, and then they work really nice to grind spices up to order if you need it, okay? So I've got that going on. So we also have the chocolate. So this can be like up to you of how much. Also, it's, it's kind of smart taste the end product. If the end product is really chocolatey, you don't want to go too far, because that's pretty chocolatey. I'm just gonna add a little bit, because it'll melt in really nicely and just accentuate the flavor that you've already done. But you don't have to go too crazy with the chocolate here. What, do you know what percent you're using here? Right nope. Brown. I had whatever Heather gave me. Um, you you wanna go heavier on the on the bitterness though. Okay. So I'd try and go 70% or higher. Okay. Yeah. Not a place for like semi-sweet, for sure. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to Add in our filling here. And depending on the recipe, this type of filling would then be put through a meat grinder after it's cooked to make sure that it's really small. We're kind of going to crush it up with our hands a little bit just to make sure that it, it's kind of fine because we want to pipe this because the style of, of pasta we're going to make, it says ravioli there, but there's one that's called um, annulotti. Anybody ever had an annulotti before? Mm -hmm. So annulotti means a pillow. And so you'll see why once we make it. It's really exciting. So we're just kind of trying to smash that all up to kind of make a homogenous mixture roughly. You still want to be able to taste the meat and have chunks of meat in it. So I think that just makes it even more of a rich dish. Um, but in Italy, like I say, they would run this through a meat grinder to make sure it's a super fine texture. I just don't think that cooked meat through a meat grinder is the greatest texture on my palate, so I don't like it. I'd much rather have like a pulled kind of texture like we're gonna do here. And this type of ravioli is like the easiest ravioli ever, in my opinion. And you're able to bust out a lot of them in a very short amount of time. All right, so now's the test. 
to see if our pasta rested long enough and it's the right consistency. So unfortunately, this is what happens every time you make pasta, is that once it rests, it'll then tell you if it's too sticky to use and you just have to use extra flour. The hope is that you don't need any flour or very little flour in order to roll this out and that's a better process. Just stuff that in a bag for me. I had a spoon here at one time. Oh, it's your next thing. Yeah. So, it's got, you'll see that it's like a filling, right? So, maybe almost half cheese, half meat. And by the time that kind of cooks together, you're going to melt some of the chocolate in there. The, the meat will also cook a little bit further after it's, it's been, you know, cooked and, you know, boiled in the water. That was really nice. It's not a very good looking mixture. Yeah, it's got tons of flavor in there. So, how many have one of these at home? Okay, you should definitely get one if you don't have one. Rolling this out by hand would be very traditional. Um, I'm not that traditional. <laughs> not that traditional. But this is what's called a mattarello, and this is what, if you've ever been to Northern Italy, you look through the shops and the windows in the morning, they're all using one of these and they're making all the pasta for the day. So they don't believe in this, they believe in handmade pasta. So if you use this, it's no longer handmade. So they get real serious about their pasta in, nor in the north. So this is on the sticky side, stickier than I really want it, but we're gonna hope a little bit. Just wanna kind of prep it. Because if you try and force it through the machine, the machine does not like to be forced. If, it, if it's too sticky, why don't you just add more flour? So yeah, you can. Okay. So but the time to add flour would have been when we were making it here mm -hmm. instead of now. Now you can add flour at this point. I'm going to avoid it though if I can, especially in the first couple rounds. So that's what you're looking for, that it goes through without sticking. The olive oil helps with that a lot. But you can also just use the air itself. Just the air itself will help you kind of like dry it out as it rolls. And what number do you have? This is on the, on the widest setting. So I'm gonna go, so pasta is supposed to be a laminated dough. Does anybody know what that means? Layers. Layers, exactly. So because it's supposed to be a laminated dough, you are supposed to, you know, fold this over a couple of times. Uh -huh. And that helps with the gluten development and it helps with uh, the chew on your palate as well. Now this could just as easily be cut into a fettuccine or a farfalle or a garganelli. You can do a lot with this pasta, so by all means you don't need to make a ravioli or a filled yeah. pasta. <laughs> yep. Honestly, this, this braise, you could easily just turn that into a sauce that you're going to toss over the pasta. You would not need to stuff this. I didn't hold your board. Are you doing okay? I think I'm, I think I'm doing it. Right. I'm doing it. Okay, so this is the part where, can everybody see? No. no. There you go. There, there you go. go, okay. So you're going to want to laminate it. So this is the part where all of you make the mistake. Everyone, I'm serious. I don't know, I've never met somebody at home that makes pasta and does this, okay? That you really have to create some folds. Okay, if you don't do that, it falls apart in the water, okay? And you almost can develop enough gluten so it'll fall apart in the water. So you have to do this part. This is the one secret. If you walked away with anything today, it's that. So I took it to about a three or a four and then I folded it over once and then we're gonna go back in. And as long as our pasta cooperates, we're gonna do that twice. And that's gonna develop extra gluten, extra strength, and extra chew. And that's what we're really looking for. And it also makes it look prettier going through. Cause like I hate those ends that are like rounded on one end and like small through another. And as you laminate it, it kind of makes it uniform. 
which makes it way easier for us to, to do. And I'm also switching the sides from side to side so that it evenly pulls to each side. Yep, so right now I'm on two, so I'm gonna jump to three, and I think that's gonna be the ticket. You only laminate once or twice? Twice is kind of the rule. Once you get past that, I don't know if you've ever like made rolls before or made sourdough is a good example. Sourdough, you'll, you'll see that when you, when you kind of make that pre-shape, you've got to wait time in order for it to relax enough to make another shape. So if you do it, go more than twice, what you'll see is that it'll, it'll be hard to put through the machine. So twice is really a good, a good amount. And you want to kind of, in the process of, of laying that down, kind of do it in order so that it kind of pushes the air out a little bit because you'll see that I might have trapped some air in it. So now we're going to go back to one. And now we're going to roll out our pasta all the way from this one. So now that it will have the strength, it will have the lamination. Oh, there wasn't any air pockets I thought there would be. And we've also taken it like from edge to edge, which I feel like is also really important. And I'm doing this backwards. I usually do it the other, the other way, I think. So if you see that it's kind of hard to go through, you can go through twice on that same setting. Don't be scared. These, these machines, they really hate flour. So when you start putting flour in them, they won't roll out properly. So this one is my machine that I brought because I know that I haven't really put a ton or any flour into it at all. So the more flour that kind of gets in these, the, the worse it performs. So I kind of have this like thin spot that's getting created from it. I'm just going to pull it over again just because I don't like it. And I'm far from a perfectionist. I don't care that much. It just, as it's going through, it could get too thin in that spot and roll through. So it'll be third lamination that we did just because the pasta seemed like it was too thin. It's okay. Questions up to this point? So now sometimes I'll jump settings. If it's going through really easily, I'll jump. So I'll go from two to three, or from, from yeah, from one to three. See, now it's got this, ooh, it's too heavy. It's not like a never thing, because if this was a little bit stickier, I, we would have to. And we'll use a little bit of flour here in a second. Because as we get thinner and thinner, you'll see that there's just no way for it to go through. And it's starting to pull on us a little bit. Which, I know, right? Camera shy. What would cause the And so if you see that where you're getting rips in it, that's probably the max that we're gonna take it. And because of the cocoa powder, we don't have near as much strength. And so we're just gonna straighten this out. Would letting it rest longer at all help with any of that? To an extent it will, but there's no gluten in cocoa powder. So letting it rest longer isn't really gonna give us a better, a better result really. But we are going to re knead this up and we're going to run through the machine again. So there's just a little bit of semolina. Brandon, once I was making fettuccine and I was using the cutting 
edge for fettuccine. I just could not get it to go through no matter what I did at that fine the Tuesday night. So what would, was my pasta too thick? Or? It could be too thick. That's usually the answer when it goes through those cutters. But I don't believe in those cutters anyway. Oh, okay. I don't like them. I think that it's way easier to cut them by hand. Um, but yeah, it's usually the cutters that has to be down to like usually the the highest setting or the thinnest setting. Yeah. Okay, so I've taken this to a five and I feel really good about it. I feel like we have a decent amount of thinness to it. The strength of the pasta, you can feel it starts to rip a little bit. So we don't want to go much further than that, okay? So we want to get off as much of the residual flour as we can. So we've got the filling here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do, can you see this? Almost. Okay, there. Now can you see it? Yes. Okay. So we're going to do almost like this snake that comes along. So this is that annulotti that I was talking about. And I think that this style is just the easiest way to create that kind of ravioli shape, or a filled pasta, really. So we're just gonna wrap it once around and then kind of wrap it so it seals over the top of it, okay? I like to pinch the ends just so I know where they're at. And then, we're going to create a separation. So what you're trying to do is trying to move the filling to the sides and you're trying to create like almost a little bubble. And the chunks of meat kind of get in your way a little bit so you have to kind of shimmy them to the side as you go. Okay. Here. So you want it to, to move now. Okay, take the cutter, go along here, and then I'm going to take the cutter in between and press out the ravioli. Now I need a wood. I knew I, was, I knew you guys were gonna ask. I got it from a shop in Bologna, Italy. Uh, but I've seen them on Amazon. We just saw them, right? So they exist on Amazon. So no worries. So and then you end up with like this little pillow. I don't know if you guys can see that very well with how dark it is. Exactly. Yeah, so you'll see it kind of open up because you've got like the beef that's kind of impeding a little bit. And so the, the classic style of annulotti is called alpine, which basically just means that it's leftovers. And so you would take whatever leftover braised beef that you might have and you're going to mix it with the ricotta the same way that we did. And that's what makes like a, a leftover filled pasta. Okay, so these are very gentle, but they're very fragile again. So we're gonna turn this down slightly. You're looking for like a simmer, not a boil. And most fresh pasta is all the same, but you're looking for a simmer and not a boil. And these are extra fragile because of the, the cocoa powder that reduced our amount of gluten that we have. So we might get some that burst open. So we're gonna taste amazing, so it's fine. So we should probably take this off. Get this out of our way. Okay. 
and you're looking for these to kind of soften up. The idea is that they'll float. It doesn't always happen. So um, it's usually about 40 seconds to a minute and a half that they'll be done. And so. A spider or a perforated spoon. Pulling them up. Okay, so another thing that if, because this beef is a little on the chunky side, you can actually pull mm -hmm. like pieces. Can you move it forward a little bit? Oh, sorry. The stain camera. So kind of leave a couple of gaps in between. So they're starting to float now. Mm -hmm. And it smells so good. It's fun, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Just like one little chunk. I wasn't even planning on putting it, but it'll be better for the fish. So yeah, so as you're... So that's what's cool about this pasta, is you can continue with that same piece and just go with it. What's that? What kind of sauce do you put this or just plain butter? So traditional would just be butter. So most raviolis, especially in Northern Italy, are just served with butter. So sometimes you'll get a little garnish with them, but they'll just be butter. There's nothing wrong with butter at all. But once again, it shows to like the richness of it. So what I'm going to serve it with is called Saba. Anybody ever heard of Saba? Yeah. Saba is like what balsamic reduction wants to be. Because okay? I don't know if anybody is here when I had the rant on on uh, balsamic reduction last time, but I went. I'm not a big fan of balsamic reduction because I think it's like just fake wannabe balsamic. But Saba is all the things that are beautiful about it. Okay? So we're going to. <coughs> Great Parmesan over. And then this Saba. So this is what it looks like. It's, it's basically a lot of the same idea of what balsamic vinegar is. It's just reduced a little bit further, um, but it's real and it's expensive. So. And where do you get it? Uh, I got this one at Caputo's this morning. How much is that? There's a smaller size too. <laughs> this is this is forty bucks. So, but that's because it's real. So the, the the balsamic reduction is usually a ton of sugar and then a really badly made balsamic, and they just cook them together. Sometimes it's even, you know, corn syrup and bad things like that. So this is our finished dish. Can you see? Is it good to see? Yeah. Yeah. I think that the saba, it has a little bit of sweetness and a little bit of acid to kind of bring all of it together. And the Parmesan cheese, obviously, is already in three, you know, two other parts of the recipe. You have chocolate and you have cocoa powder. So one thing that um, this cocoa powder, it does make it a little bit hard to work with. So it would be totally fine to use a regular pasta recipe, which I think I have one that we've posted to Orson Dickey before. Um, 
they would just have more strength in it. That way, making everything else, the filling with the chocolate and not double dipping in the chocolate as much. Okay? Any questions? Are you going to taste that? Yes. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I thought the same thing. <laughs> so, Franco, what is balsamic cream? I was in Europe and brought some back. I wasn't even sure what it was, but I... So, that's usually what's called a condimento, which is like a, a reduction of balsamic. And so, it's the same kind of style as this. It's just a... So, the way it works in Maldonado, which is really cool, is that when you're born, they'll, they'll put balsamic vinegar in a barrel for you. Mm. And then when you're married, you're then able to then take out on that deposit and you're able to use the balsamic vinegar. So you think, think it's got to be 18, 20 years aged in a barrel, which is going to reduce over time. It's going to be syrupy. It's going to be delicious and beautiful. And so Americans, they don't have time to wait ever, right? <laughs> So they decided, you know what, we're gonna create this same flavor, but we're gonna make it only take a week, maybe even a couple days. And so in our ingenuity, we've taken something and ruined it, in my opinion. Um, but with that said, balsamic production is still pretty tasty on a salad, right? Yeah. But I just think that there are better things, but like the creme is what they call it, a creme or or, uh, of balsamic, that's just a reduction. So, same style as the American. They got smart too and said, well, we might as well export this since they're making it in the US anyway. So if you invest $40 in a bottle like that, how long does it last? Oh man, this will this will last you years. Yeah, if you saw how much I put on it, it was barely a tablespoon over the top. So it'll last you a long time. So it won't go back. No, 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 no. No, it's it it's has it has it it has a um, acid in it as well, and it has been aged. And the things that are in there will only get better with time. So. Are there any other fillings you can use with the chocolate? Of course. I mean, you could put whatever you wanted technically in here. But um, I think that if you wanted to do like a, a braised pork or like a bolognese type thing, but once again, this style of ravioli is from any leftovers that you have. So whatever leftovers beef or if you had, what do you call it, uh, meatloaf, those kind of things, would easily mix together with the same spices, the same um, ricotta cheese, and parmesan. Great question. What about a Snickers bar? Yeah. <laughs> you could definitely put a Snickers bar in here. I think that I would probably omit the parmesan cheese. I don't know if they are the greatest pairing together, but... <laughs> But once again, the world is your oyster, you know? How long can you use the open wine? Open wine? That's a good question. Because it will start to get a little weird yeah. after a few days. That's what sucks. But for cooking, it's not that big of a deal. So if you were planning on cooking some and drinking some, then you got two days and it's already bad. Um, if you're planning on just cooking with it, I wouldn't worry. I think that I've left it at room temperature for weeks at a time and never had any issues with my cooking. Nope. But like I said, if you were going to try and drink it afterwards, you would be very disappointed. <laughs> so what's the longest you leave it at room temperature? For cooking? I, I don't think there would be a time. I think that I would smell it. Like if it starts to smell like vinegar, it's going to taste like vinegar in your end product. So I would avoid it if it tastes really acidic. But other than that. Interesting. I have never tried freezing the wine, but that makes a ton of sense. Because you would have, because the only reason why wine goes bad is from oxygen. So as long as you were in, uh, you know, had it sealed off, I think it should freeze out as well. You could start. Freezing wine, huh?
Um, no, not really, because it's so hard because every single liquor store is going to have different things. If there was one that I would look towards, uh, it just depends on how much money you want to spend on it. What's cool about wine is that like seven out of ten times, however much money you spend on it is how good it's going to taste. And then the other three out of ten times, it's all marketing and makes no sense, right? So... Um, I would lean towards anything that they that that claims to be all natural or even organic, and I would just stick to those ones, just because you're gonna, you're not going to have the sulfites in it. Another idea is whatever type of food you're making. If you know a region of that type of food, you can find the region of the wine, and that's really that's always a good way of doing it. So like this type of food or this type of pasta would be more from. Uh, Bologna. So if you went a Northern Italian or a Mina Romana wine, it would probably be the best. Uh, no, no, because this one, this is a great wine, and I want to say this was 14 bucks. I, I wouldn't spend four dollars on a gallon. You're gonna get like some gnarly stuff in there, right? But in general, I think that you'll have a great experience with anything in like that 12 to 20 dollar range. And you're, you're going to use two cups for this recipe, a cup for the next recipe. Do a deglaze the next time you have a, a, you know, a sauce. Oh. Because we got another round coming in right now. Oh, shoot. We're all waiting true. outside the door. So I we, take too long. We're not um, trying to rush you, but we're rushing you. <laughs> <laughs> we're just making them. And now, the and now you know that this man has like so much knowledge in his brain that when you come to his class and he spends four hours talking to you, <laughs> you'll understand why. And you won't be tired of any of the information because he has a lot to share. We love Brandon for that. Oh, sorry, Brandon, today's not all about you. I know. <laughs> What's that? No, no, because you're putting the cheese in and everything else that is already cold too, so it's not going to hurt you much. When's the next class supposed to be here? Oh, nice. Okay, never mind. <laughs> I mean, I, you're way late. I started ten minutes late, though. We're just bumping everybody back. We're just making them jealous that they didn't join us. Exactly. Next time, what do you think? Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.